And for those that didn't attend um, in February, Dr. Kavader is a um, physician with uh, Mass General Brigham, a name change from uh, partners. He's also a professor of dermatology with Harvard Medical School. And uh, he's now president of the American Telehealth Association. Back in February, he was president-elect, but eventually uh, it did, uh, did happen. Um, in his spare time, Joe is also the editor-in-chief of NP NPJ Digital Medicine. And um, if you, you, know, you may have seen uh, Joe also be interviewed by a number of interviews and other forums. He's a, he's a frequent... Um, uh, requested uh, person for interviews, so you'll see him uh, quoted in a lot of different uh, forums. So we're really excited uh, to have Joe back to uh, give us an update on uh, telehealth. And uh, so Joe, I'll let you take it away. Thanks so much, Ed. And let me see, the first thing is, okay, so someone needs to allow me to share my screen, please. Maybe whoever the... Bert, do you want to handle that or? You're good to go, Joe. I hope so. There we are. Well, a lot has happened, and, and it is remarkable. I, uh, I think yours was maybe the next to last talk that I gave before we don't give talks anymore, except in, in this new uh, uh, mode of doing it via, via Zoom or what have you. Um, and then, so I, of course, went back and looked at those slides, and they, they seem rather quaint and yesteryear. And, and again, it's only been since the 1st of February. And that's, I just think, a really remarkable backdrop to what we're going to talk about today. And I'm sure we'll have a lively dialogue. Um, a lot has happened. I'm going to go through that. I'm, I'm going to essentially go through a little bit of the same history as I did last time, very brief. And then um, where we are, because it's pretty interesting what... Uh, where we've settled out and then uh, quite a bit, I think of the last half about what this means for healthcare delivery at large and really appealing to the entrepreneurial side of the audience because I'm sure there are people out there who wanna contribute and, and um, make healthcare better. And there's, there's really, this is an opportunity to do that. So this fundamentally is the problem that um, didn't go away and ha hasn't changed and, and, and was with us before the pandemic. And that is this uh, notion that the demand for healthcare services is outstripping the supply of providers. Now, the most important part of the graph is the assumption that the only way you can achieve service is to be one-on-one -on -one with someone in a, in, in, I used to say in a physical location. Now, I, of course, we can do one-on-one -on -one via video and, and we'll talk more about that. But that um, needs to change. And all, all many, many other services you consume um, now have a digital front end. You interact with software, you interact with bots, you interact, you, you do things for yourself. Healthcare, we, we're just starting to think about that. And we have to get there because as you can see, we're just losing the battle in terms of our ability to provide service. And that shows up for you as being frustrated with a long wait in the waiting room or not be getting enough time with your provider. It shows up as physician burnout on our side. So that's kind of the core problem. So telehealth as we know it today, five months after I was with you all, is a step in the right direction. Again, I'm gonna talk more about that. But we have a long way to go, and we'll talk about that uh, as well. So the idea is one to many, one to many, and that how do we get to one to many? And I'll, I have to say, for both patients and doctors, this is a bit of a scary proposition because people are used to that. When, when you when you find a doctor that you like, you feel it's a very intimate human interaction, maybe among the most intimate, next to perhaps a family member. And the idea that some of that might be handled by a software or a bot or uh, uh, artificial intelligence can, can be very frightening. And I would just say that that's all the more reason for us to lean in and figure it out because it can be done. Other industries have done this. Um, may, maybe they're not as intimate as healthcare, but there are lots and lots of examples, and I'll get to some of them towards the end of the talk, of organizations that are chipping away at this one too many and um, it's a pretty exciting future that we have. So we, we definitely have to get it right. No one should be feel they're not cared for. 
but also if we just keep providing service one-on-one, -on -one, we're, we're never gonna get to the finish line. This is also review, uh, but be, because uh, again, we've had such a rapid uh, escalation of, of telehealth, I wanted to go over the taxonomy uh, with you briefly again. So the way this works, and this was created by my colleagues at the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital Telehealth Center. The rows have to do with who's conferring with who, the top row being provider to patient, everything there is a visit. And then the bottom row, provider to provider, everything is a consult. The columns have to do with whether it's real-time synchronous, i.e. similar to what we're doing now, and that would be virtual. So, and, and then, and the second is uh, what we call asynchronous or store and forward is store and forward more of a telehealth lingo from years ago, but the idea would be analogous to an email exchange or a text exchange. And you can see those are E. So if, if uh, you're, if, if you, remember I'm a dermatologist, if you send me some pictures over our patient portal and I respond, that would be an E visit. Uh, if you, God forbid, came into Cape Cod Hospital with symptoms of a stroke and they had a stroke consult from someone at Mass General be a video conferencing, that would be a virtual consult. So the idea of the taxonomy is just when we start to throw this lingo around, it doesn't uh, confuse people. Right, so what changed since I came and visited you in, in February? Well, a lot. And, and the fundamental thing, uh, which by the way, we're, we're coming away from, thank God now, at least in Massachusetts, uh, was the notion that you had to stay at home and you were afraid to go out. Um, now, March was a pretty bleak month for most of us, April too, and then things started to get a little better. And they're not, we're not out of the woods, but it's at least, we're, we're in some sort of hybrid environment now. But what that did was it forced new workflows immediately. And I'll show you some data in a few minutes on this. Uh, but for patients and providers both. I think that's the critical thing. And, and uh, I, I suspect when we, when we review, not we, but those of us who do history, review this 50 years from now, they'll talk about that inflection point being forced by a global pandemic. We don't know how long it's gonna be around, but it seems to be quite persistent and changing fundamentally what we had to do to offer care to our patients. That's critical. Now the government helped us, and you can see in the bottom uh, bullets, the government helped us in three important ways. And these are things that I'll come back to because in the future, we wanna pay close attention to these to see just how much telehealth sticks. Some people are starting to estimate how that hybrid environment is gonna work. So the one is reimbursement. Um, our colleagues at Medicare uh, reimburse now for telephone, uh, video, asynchronous, everything. Uh, will that continue? Uh, well, we, we have some, um, some evidence that it will, but I can go into more detail on that uh, later. Technology is perhaps the one that has the most um, of a question mark next to it. So what, what that means is that uh, during the public health emergency, they specifically won't hold a, a provider accountable to HIPAA for any technology used. That's all it means. So they, what it, the way it came out in the, in the press was you could use Skype, FaceTime, Google Hangouts, pick your, pick your favorite video uh, conferencing tool for your patients, which I think was a wonderful thing because of bullet number one, we said, you, you've got to stay at home and we have to work right away to get you cared for. But I think we all also intuit, and this is a technology council that, that, that uh, that's probably not a good long-term solution. Like patient privacy is critical and having this kind of wide open IT environment where any app goes probably doesn't make a lot of sense for the long run. So I think that one is probably gonna be trimmed back some. And it could be as simple as saying, we're gonna go back to requiring that vendors sign a business associate agreement. And some of them, like I don't think Apple FaceTime will do that. Some of them will then drop out of the running, I think. The last is, is provider licensure. Um, it, it's probably, you're all aware that prior to this, uh, I was like, like many professions, I'm licensed in the state of Massachusetts. That means I can't practice in another state unless I get credentialed there. 
usually a very lengthy process. During the public health emergency, 49 out of 50 states have relaxed those requirements uh, such that I can now, for instance, very easily, in fact, for, for, for a patient that's in Rhode Island, I have no barrier. For a patient that's in New Hampshire, I, sh I have to go through a, a short process with the New Hampshire board. Those are just two examples. Again, how much of that will stick? Some people think there should be national licensure. Perhaps we can talk about that as well. So telehealth is now a household word. That's kind of the bottom line. And, and it, it was not when I came to visit you in February. You all are, uh, I think, uh, uh, perhaps a, a little bit more of an educated crowd than most because of your interest in technology. But let's face it, this, this was a new concept for, I don't know, maybe 95 to 99% of the US populace. Now it's a household word. Everywhere I go, I had a telehealth visit with my doctor. Uh, you know, a doctor's talking about it. Doctors came on board. And for those of us that are trying to move the vision forward, you, you just can't measure how critical of a gift that is for us. You know, with that said, there's been a lot of growth. So these uh, numbers now feel a little bit dated. Once again, things are moving so fast. Uh, but these are just four or five delivery systems, uh, including our own, which I have to go back and relabel as Mass General Brigham. Um, so I'll just give you our numbers because I know them the best. But, and, and again, everyone around the country, whether it be vendor or healthcare provider has seen similar uh, increases. So in February, when I was visiting all of you, across our system, we did 1,600 virtual encounters. By May 1st, we were doing 60,000 a week. And uh, again, that is not atypical. Uh, where is it going to settle out? Well, we're still learning that because we're in this new hybrid environment and, and, I, and we're gonna talk more about that uh, in the second half of the talk. So enormous increase. What's kind of, I think the, the best part of this story, this slide, is that we didn't see any untoward consequences. We didn't hurt any patients that we know of. When you think about scaling something that rapidly, you think there's got to be problems. So far, no problems have been reported, and it's been you know a long time. So, uh, thankfully, uh, it seems like it's gone very well. This is just one example of uh, how practice came to abruptly change. This is a primary care practice in Boston at the Beth Israel. Deaconess Medical Center. And the blue uh, lines indicate volume of in-person encounters. And the uh, green lines indicate volume of telehealth, or telephone rather, encounters. And you can just see it flip like a switch in the middle of March when we went into stay-at-home mode. Again, this is, this is typical. And at that time, now again, this was published in uh, late April, so the data is probably good from early April, about 30% of visits in that uh, particular practice were telemedicine. And it seems as though that's kind of where it's coming out in the hybrid environment. Now that we're back to seeing patients in the office, most people are comfortable that they're going to be somewhere between 20 and 80%. And it's going to vary, uh, as is indicated in this slide. So what this is, you kind of have to read it backwards. So rather than read it, let me explain it. Um, what you have here is different specialties and you the, consider it this way, the bars are a reflection for how easy it is for them to do telehealth. So ophthalmology is my favorite example because as the person pictured on the left is doing, you have to go in the office for them to do anything. You have to put your head in the slit lamp, or the refractor or what have you. You, can't, you just can't do that stuff at home, at least not yet. So that means that they have about a 20% opportunity to do anything by telehealth. Whereas behavioral health on the bottom, if you think about it, the whole interaction can be done by video quite nicely. And so they're up 70%, some people say 80%. Uh, and then you can see up and down uh, the chart how that works. So every specialty is a little bit different but everyone's got a hybrid environment now. And for those of us who are thinking about the future of healthcare, I think that's unlikely to change. And again, we'll go over maybe why I speculate that. So we've successfully brought 
the doctor's office into the home. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, this is a milestone. And I don't mean to imply that we shouldn't be proud of that milestone because again, it worked and we, we haven't messed anybody up. But it's not, uh, it's not the end game because of that one-to-many problem that I mentioned. That's gotta be solved. Bringing the doctor's office into the home via video does not solve one-to-many. And with that, I'm going to see if there are questions, Ed, and, and I'm actually gonna put my video off for a second, but I will be here. So questions from uh, the audience. Let me take a look at the um, chat. I have a verbal question when you're ready. Sure, go ahead, Eldon. I'm just reading through these. Okay, Joe, the uh, one thing that, at least from my point of view, I, I don't see um, are replacements for the sensors that are in the, uh, the physician's office, blood pressure, pulse rate, some of the reasonably more straightforward ones. Um, what's the outlook you're seeing for getting those into the home? Yeah, it's a great question. So I've been threatening and I just haven't had the time. As Ed said, I, my, my, um, my life's been busy in a good way, but I've been threatening to do a study on how everyone ended up getting a mercury thermometer in their home, whenever that happened in history. Because I think whatever that was, that everyone said, oh my God, you have to be able to take someone's temperature. Uh, it's an indication of illness. Um, there, there are companies, and I'll talk about a couple of them later, but there's one, for instance, called TitoCare. And it's one device, but it can allow you to look in your throat, look in your ear, take your temperature, take your heart rate, take your EKG, all in one small device. Mm -hmm. And so the riddle is, just as you, as you asked, how do we get that into everyone's medicine cabinet? And um, whether that's maybe through an insurance model, it, it's, it's still up in the air, but it has to be, I agree with you, it has to be tested. Thank you. Good question, Ellen. I'm sorry, did you have a follow-up, Ellen? No, no, I was just saying thank you for the answer. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've definitely had some discussion of that in the past, and, and I agree with Joe, there's a lot of different uh, models for it. One is insurance companies because they will realize cost savings by not having you come into the doctor's office. You may get a welcome kit that has a lot of these different technologies in it that may be worth, you know, even though it could be hundreds of dollars, um, to mail it to a uh, you know, <coughs> client. Yeah, for those of us that get paid by the minute, um, you know, that time savings as it, as it does for a commute for, for working, uh, you know, is, a, is somewhat of a factor in it. You know? We don't take the time to go in and wait for an office visit. Great. Let me go through a couple other questions. And, and we do still have, Joe has uh, more slides to go through. So we'll take a couple now. Um, one question, Joe, is do you see changes in HIPAA coming uh, due to, to, or to enable changes in, in telehealth? It's a good question. And, and I don't have a crystal ball on that. I, I guess the only thing I would say, HIPAA is arguably, I think it's 15 years old now. So arguably it, it is very old and arguably needs to be fixed. Um, just given everything else that's on the plate of our legislators in an election year and the way they operate, I can't imagine it's gonna be tended to at least in, in the next 12 months. Um, so, we, I think we have what we have, um, and I, as I said, I believe it's more likely that we will start asking vendors to comply more than we did during the public health emergency. All right. And despite not having a crystal ball, Joe did uh, recently also found time to um, provide testimony and present a Senate, uh, U.S. Senate hearing, so he's, he's got uh, quite a bit of insight as usual. Um, Joe, another question. Can you expand on the likelihood of licensing becoming federalized beyond the pandemic, uh, as, in, as is the case in military medicine and the VA. And this, is, this has helped with the shortage of providers and the allocation of providers in, in time of crisis. Again, great question. State medical boards have been um, guardedly holding on to their territory for a long time, maybe centuries. Um, and I don't see that changing. What could happen, I'm, I'm more optimistic about regional compacts. So let's say, for instance, I mentioned 
two use cases of my own, given that I'm in Eastern Massachusetts. Maybe we have a compact with the New England states, New York and New Jersey. So, and when you think about it, the, the chance, healthcare still is a fairly local business. So the chance that I, I might have to provide care, tele, telehealth care to someone in say Montana seems pretty remote. Whereas those states seem like more fair game because the idea of course behind all this is someone comes to visit you for something. Let's say, God forbid someone has a melanoma and I take it out and then they go back home to Nashville, New Hampshire. We want to do a wound check by telehealth. That's the kind of use case we're talking about here. And so I think um, that's more likely to be the case. It, I would just, the other thing I would say about licensure is it is, it, it exists for a reason. We, 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 we vilify the boards because we all get frustrated with the, the pace at which they move. But we are a profession. We're supposed to. We're supposed to police ourselves. We're supposed to rat out and, and weed out people that aren't ethical and or credential or or, or uh, qualified. And I would say pretty hard to do that on a national basis. Uh, I think it'd be difficult. Okay. Thank you, Joan. One more, perhaps, or shall I go on? Yeah, we've got. Um... One more, actually, one, one is a few more future question, so I'll wait because I know you've, uh, I've seen the future uh, and I've seen some of the slides, so I'll hold off on that. Um, there's a question, sort of a statement, isn't telehealth adoption more of a regional issue with rural areas faster to offer telehealth services because of the lack of other practical methods of delivering medical services? Yeah, great question. So prior to the pandemic, I would have said, I mean, absolutely yes, and I think probably made some commentary along those lines when I visited you in person uh, and during the winter. Um, however, there's plenty of urban need. Uh, one of the things we may or may not get to cover today is, is uh, disparities and uh, et cetera, and there's plenty of urban need. What we're learning and what we have learned from the pandemic is that, so let me back up and say one of the it may, it may not, I don't know the question, it may not be uh, um, inherent in, in your view, but one, when often when people ask that question, they have a sense that telehealth is somehow less effective than in person, and therefore you'd put up with it if you were in the, in the stick somewhere, whereas if you were in the middle of the city, you wouldn't. And what we've learned is that's simply not true, that there are plenty of indications where it's as good as or even better in certain cases than being with someone in person. And so that's, that's changing it. The reason, fundamental reason that rural was such a, a bastion was because for many uh, years, 15 or 20 years, the government paid, that is Medicare paid, only if you were in a rural area. Which by the way, while I have that point, because I, I wanna make this point for anyone who has any government relations uh, business or dealings or uh, has a straight line to any of our elected representatives. They, that's a law. That, 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 or what they call the originating site rule is a law. That means that uh, when the public health emergency is lifted, if we don't change the law, Medicare will be forced to go back to reimbursing only if you're in a rural environment. And we can't really do that. We're now, we're, we're too far gone in terms of offering this hybrid environment. So, We've impressed, that was ma the major point I made in my Senate testimony. We've, we've tried to impress that on people and uh, anyone in the audience who has that opportunity, I, I wish you would uh, make that case. Thank you, Joe. That's a, actually a great segue. Uh, we've got some more questions coming in. I'll hold off on those till the end of your- We'll have time, don't, don't fret. This, this, right, we'll this time, next phase won't, won't take that long. Okay, so Joe, why don't you uh, carry on? Right, so this is this is where we're going, and and uh, this is such an important. Uh, I'm, those of you who know how health insurance works, uh, uh, reimbursement and coverage. Usually, what happens is there's a process. I'm involved with it now at the AMA called the CPP process, where you create reimbursement codes. They go through evaluation, then they get put on Medicare's desk once a year. Medicare decides what to pay for or not. And this particular administrator, Seema Verma, has been the most telehealth friendly administrator in history, even before the pandemic. 
And this is a quote from her. She's been on record saying this multiple times in the last few months. So it's, it's not like this was a photo op or something. She really believes it. And the reason that's important is because in general, as Medicare goes, health insurance goes. Not always, and it sometimes takes time. But in general, when Medicare covers something, it sort of trickles down to all of those private payers that millions of them over the 50 states and this convoluted network. Medicaid often being the last because they're always poor and they're always reluctant to cover new things. But this is important. Now, right now we're still in the public health emergency and everything's on the table. And uh, as I said, our hybrid environment uh, at Mass General Brigham now is, is somewhere around 30% telehealth, maybe up to 50% depending on the practice and, and the specialty. Uh, and as I say, mental health even more than that. Uh, so as long as we have those, uh, the ability for us to be reimbursed, uh, that we see that continuing. The one other caveat I'll just quickly mention is telephone only for uh, ever. Um, Medicare considered a telephone call between a doctor and a patient to be bundled into an office visit. So I see you in the office, we have a nice chat, you go home, we say, oh my God, I forgot to ask him a question. You call me up, we, I answer the question. Unlike an attorney, I don't bill for that. That was the previous. Now I can because of the public health emergency. Will that stick? We don't know, but it is a digital divide crossing tool. A lot of people, again, speaking to disparities, have made the point that not everyone has broadband, not everyone can afford a smartphone, and audio only, as we've learned, is quite effective and can help us cross the digital divide. So just something to, to note there. Well, I mentioned earlier that we're, when we've really talked a lot about all three of these trends, um, keep an eye on the news, especially if, if you're a business supplier to healthcare or, or if you're in the business of supplying technology to, that will be used in telehealth. Um, those, those three gating factors are gonna be enormously important. And um, as I said, some of them are regulatory, but some of them are statutory. Uh, HIPAA is a, a statute, um, uh, the, the originating site rule that I mentioned is a, is a statute, licensure state by state, but just keep an eye on those. We, we don't know how they'll turn out. I'm, as, as was mentioned, I'm president now of American Telemedicine Association, and we are spending all of our policy energy on trying to keep as much of that, uh, one in three anyway, um, open as possible. Cement the gains is the hashtag that we use. Uh, again, recognizing that HIPAA probably is a good thing and, and it, will, it will be brought back in on, on the second bullet. Now, I'm gonna talk more about the second set of bullets, so I'm gonna leave that for now uh, because in the next set of slides, those come up. As I said, there's this subtext of wanting to be more efficient because we just can't provide all the care we need to provide if we do it face-to-face which is why I expect to see more asynchronous visits. Um, and by the way, all of this, I think I've made this point, but I wanna make it again, if, if you're viewing this from the point of view of being a patient, you must feel cared for. You must get what you want. If you wanna come in to see us in the office for every visit, you should be allowed to do that. Again, not in a public health emergency in general. Now that we're back to seeing patients in the office. You should be allowed to do that. No one should be denying you the care you want. You know, that said, as, as was mentioned in one of the questions, it's pretty convenient for me to call you at a time when you're home and have a chat. And you don't have to travel. You don't have to wait in a waiting room. You don't have to sit in another room with a gown on getting cold. Um, so for a lot of these kinds of uh, what I call algorithmic relationships with your doctor about say your blood pressure medicine or your cholesterol, those the kinds of things will be more uh, appealing to you when done uh, remotely. And remote patient monitoring, I'll just put, put a, again, the question was asked about devices before. We don't really have time to go into that in great detail. I'm just doing some research on it now across the country. It's slow in adoption. It's, the, the video visit is, is the big thing du jour. Uh, it's the next phase because again, if we're able to monitor you in the home with your chronic illness, 
it's much more efficient than doing a video visit. So you'll see that come out. And again, if you're a business that is either a supplier or a vendor in that space, um, you're gonna see your day come in the next few years. So this is our opportunity to reimagine health capability. It, it, again, we, we can be um, pleased that we brought the doctor's office into the home, but let's face it, we have a long way to go. So let me walk through this stuff and then I think we'll have plenty of time for some more dialogue. I like this analogy a lot. Um, and I, cause I think this is what we've done now with, with the virtual visit, the, the video visit. When Alcoa invented aluminum, they didn't know what to do with this new light, um, strong material. So they, they familiarized it and, and they, you would see coat racks made of aluminum, but painted with wood grain. So people were familiar with it. What, what, what the actual material was more comforting to people. And of course, there are all kinds of examples uh, of this, uh, the first automobiles um, being more like horse carriages and et cetera. And that's what we've done with a virtual visit. We've taken something we do in the office, we've separated it by distance, but not to beat a dead horse, but that, that's just the beginning, folks. And we have to reimagine completely how we deliver care. This is a rendering of a building that's supposed to go up uh, next to uh, my home uh, hospital, the Massachusetts General Hospital. And it's on hold right now because we were for a while losing money as a system. But the point of the, the slide is just to say that every hospital executive is now rethinking how they use their brick and mortar, how they use their facility fees, how they calculate. <coughs> and the like, because in this world where I can do a telehealth session half a day and Tuesday afternoons I do now from my own uh, home office, um, what does that mean for overhead? What does that mean for cost of care? What does that mean for uh, uh, practice expense? And it's a whole new world. We've got to then rethink. Now, what's nice is it seems that right now anyway, and we'll, this may be due to a backlog, but no-show rates in all cases are going down. For, for virtual, the no-show rate is, is infinitesimal because I call you and you're kind of waiting for me to call. But back in the office, people are coming in because they feel like, oh my goodness, I got an appointment. Thank God I'm able to get in. So this hybrid environment could be one where everyone feels like they're getting the maximum care in the environment they need to get it. And they're a little more respectful of that. So that's possible too. Anyway, if you're a building architect, if you're an urban planner, if you're any of those, you're gonna have a lot of business in the years to come because we have to figure out how we do this if we're gonna do 20 to 50% of our visits virtually. Now, one to many is something I talked about earlier. And the next few slides have uh, examples of companies, which I probably won't uh, dwell on many of them. If, if uh, I think we can make the slides available um, uh, later and, and if you want to do research on any of these you can. They're just examples of companies that are doing interesting things. Uh, for instance, Bayesian is an AI company birthed out of Johns Hopkins. Uh, BrightMD is, is an interesting company because it starts out with, and a lot of them do, uh, with software front end and eventually you get to a person. So again, weeding out common um, uh, questions, things that could be asked, uh, sorry, answered by, by software. One to many. And they're really in remote monitoring is an example of this. There are many, many examples of how we can start to do this. And as I've said now, probably too many times, we have to, we have to continue to focus on that. We talked about home devices. We didn't really talk about home testing, so I'll address that now. Um, Despite, I don't know how many of you followed the debacle of Theranos and, and what a, a, a black mark that left on, on the digital health industry, but despite that, there are companies, one of them is right here in Boston called Boston Micropolitics, that are on the cusp of delivering some really powerful testing by just a drop or two of blood uh, in the home. So once again, imagine that you get a kit you put a couple drops of blood and all those tests that you get for your annual visit are done. Then you can have your video with your doctor and talk about your cholesterol, talk about uh, uh, your, your A1C, what have you, without leaving your home. 
so much more powerful than just a video visit alone. So you can look forward to more and more on the home testing front uh, as we continue to see this blossom. Uh, I like to remind people that when my mom uh, conceived me, you had to kill a rabbit to find out you're pregnant. Uh, now, of course, you do it in the privacy of your own bathroom. That's where this whole industry is headed and telehealth would just be a way to lift it along because there's now a use case to get those home tests more and more into the marketplace. This one we haven't talked about and I, and I would like to spend a little bit of time on it because it's, I find it very exciting. <clears throat> now, full disclosure, uh, I am an advisor to the company on the top left, ResApp. They're an Australian company and they have software in the smartphone that can detect the sound of your cough and diagnose pneumonia, bronchitis, uh, asthma, et cetera, just from the sound of the cough. So once again, picture yourself having a cough, getting on a video with your doctor, and your doctor all of a sudden does not need to listen to your lungs because the software has made a diagnosis. Beyond Verbal is famous for having done something similar with, believe it or not, heart attack. They published a study a couple of years ago that showed that their software, based on the tone of your voice, could predict that you were about to have a heart attack. Amazing stuff. And then Sond is a Boston-based company that can tell by the sound of your voice. And again, this is nothing, none of these are about content, just sound, but can tell by the sound of your voice whether you're depressed or not. So these are tools that will start to come into the marketplace as well. And they will just augment the opportunity for us to make that virtual visit more and more powerful. Devices, digital biomarkers, and home testing. Those are the three. And I mentioned earlier that I would uh, re reflect on those. As I mentioned, asynchronous is going to be big. There's a whole industry around chatbots, asynchronous, symptom checkers, and what I call very specific telehealth applications. So here you have HIMS uh, and Nurex on the bottom left. Nurex being a women's health company that uses telehealth to prescribe birth control and, and a variety of other uh, women's health issues related to sexual health. HIMS, similar for men, um, uh, erectile dysfunction and some other things. Very specific, very successful, very well-funded uh, companies. Babylon is a British company uh, and they've had a very big uh, presence in the National Health Service doing front-end artificial intelligence-based uh, chats with patients. Again, getting them to a human being when they need to, uh, but front-end is more chatbot than, uh, than person. So those are some examples of that. This part is still messy. This part is still in development. It needs a lot of refinement so that you are comfortable with it as a, as a consumer of healthcare services, but we have to get there. And I have to say, with so much going on in the marketplace in terms of innovation, I believe we will get there. I think it's going to be within five years, 10 at the, at the most. So really, what I'm talking about, and this is my next to the last slide, is an integrated digital and in-person experience. I used to talk about Uber uh, back in the day when, when I was still evangelizing this future. Because all the techno, and again, this is a technology council, so you all know this, all the technologies that made, make Uber possible are sort of in the background. We take them for granted, whether it's GPS, whether it's databases, whether it's uh, fairly high speed uh, wireless uh, infrastructure, um, et cetera. We're going to have to use all those tools to make your healthcare experience similar. Um, and that means you'll open up your phone you'll uh, put some information in. It will decide whether you need to go to urgent care, whether you need a video visit, whether you can be going through a software chat, whether you need to go to the emergency room, whether you should be in your doctor's office or a specialist. And if we do it right, <clears throat> once that determination is made, other services will come into play, such as location-based, yes, you should go to urgent care. There are five near you. This one has a 10 minute wait. And, or uh, the, right now the emergency room at your local hospital is a, is a, is a two hour wait. Uh, but if you go 10 miles further, you'll have X. Those kinds, and then when you get to the place, wayfinding apps, completely integrated digital 
in-person experience. Eventually receiving some service from a person in almost all cases, but with a lot of digital integration around that to make your experience more uh, convenient and high quality. So that's what I have to say today. I'm looking forward to the next, I don't know, 12 minutes or so of questions. I appreciate all of your time. I, I really enjoyed coming in person. I, I do feel, uh, I have to be honest, as much as I'm an evangelist for this stuff, it's, I do feel a twinge of uh, sadness that I can't be around and share breakfast with you, shake some hands. That part I miss, but um, thank God we have all these technologies to even do this. So uh, this is me, that's my website, et cetera. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Ed. Great. Thank you, uh, Jill. That was really uh, terrific. I just wanted to reflect on what you presented in the local experience at uh, Cape Cod Healthcare, uh, where I work. We absolutely saw the things that um, you've described and the benefits and the rapid uh, adoption the uh, month of March. We found ourselves buying tablet computers and iPads in bulk and distributing to physicians who had you know, no experience um, with this type of technology. We also saw it being used by our visiting nurse association, and it had a benefit around um, in the early stages of COVID and it hasn't gone away is preservation of uh, personal protective equipment. So we found, you know, I mentioned this to you that um, the fewer times, you know, certainly we want patient engagement where it's needed, but um, if we were able to find ways, and the VNA is a good example, um, to reduce that direct engagement or changing between patients, going from room to room even, simple things like that, yeah. would keep a, a clinical worker from having to remove their PPE and, and uh, change it. So it really uh, had great benefit. And like I said, everything you described in the rapid adoption has occurred. Um, we do have a lot of questions queued up. Um, one I want to combine with one of my own that I heard um, a term, I think uh, you had mentioned in an interview, which is... Um, website manner and the whole topic about how physicians are, are dealing with this. Um, but there was also a question about, um, someone mentioned about stress on uh, healthcare workers, uh, even administrative personnel in medical facility. You know, they're getting more stressed and on edge um, with the pandemic. So have you seen studies or can you mention, um, you know, maybe how they're using telehealth um, for their own mental health problems? So the, the second one, it, it, it is uh, easy in the sense that I, I don't have any data on that. I, I, I think you're right that it, it is it is a it's a tough time for everyone. It's really interesting. I was in the office, physical office, yesterday all day, and I, I've just opened every visit with a patient with how are you doing, how are things, what's your how's your mental health because everyone's stressed and the uncertainty is killing all of us. But I don't I don't know the the answer to that. Website manner is is a term. It's actually not a new term, but it's sort of undergone a renaissance. Um, the, the way I can, and, and if any of you have had this training, I think you'll resonate, but the way I think about it is, as, as we did today, I, I didn't, so when I was with you before, I could stand in front of you, use body language, I could sense the audience, I could interact. Um, on a Zoom call, <clears throat> I get none of that. So I lean more into my voice, I try to be more expressive with my face, almost like an actor. Um, to try to be more engaging to the audience. I don't know if I was successful or not. But the point is, website manner is really about learning some very simple things like stare at the camera, don't stare at the desk. That's a simple one, but it's important because if you're looking or looking at a screen because you're typing in the electronic record, you know, that's out. But it's also just realizing that if you're going to create that emotional bond over a technology, you have to do it differently. And... Um, so we do train people in that now, and I think it's exciting to see that come about. That's great, and you did very well, Joe. <laughs> very engaging. Thank you. Um, there's a question related to um, uh, malpractice and around uh, missed, um, misdiagnosis and missed um, diagnosis, and uh, the question is, how is malpractice liability working thus far for um, telehealth visits? So two, two answers to that, um, three answers. One is there has been almost no case law in the, I don't know, 30 or so years that people have really been doing telemedicine. Now, I, I, I say that and then I, I quickly add, that doesn't mean there aren't 
um, negligent, you know, there isn't negligence or that there aren't cases brewing. We don't, we don't know every case, it takes years for these things to, to, to come into, uh, into the consciousness. Um, the second thing I'll say is <clears throat> during the pandemic, malpractice carriers, or, or I'm sorry, the government, and at least in Massachusetts, and I think this is not national as well, has said that uh, clinicians won't be held liable for, um, for decisions that they make. Now, I should probably have saved that for last because it feels like a cop-out. The, the issue though around um, malpractice in telehealth is really about especially now that we're in this environment where I have the choice. I can bring you in if I want, and you can come in if you want. It's really about the clinician being comfortable that the data they need to make a decision, whether it be diagnostic or therapeutic, they can gather that data without touching the patient. And that's sort of the simplest way to put it. And if you can, you can do it by telehealth, and the work should be the same, the value, the quality, everything should be the same. If there's some reason that the patient either has to travel for a test or for a physical exam, probably shouldn't be doing it by telehealth, and that's gonna help you with those potential negligence uh, scenarios. Great, thank you. A Couple of questions on the other side of um, the cost equation, um, Joe. Do you, um, what do you see about healthcare Pricing changing in terms of like a 10 minute video appointment compared to a 30 minute um, uh, doctor's visit. Also another question for telehealth visits. Um, how are insurance, how are insurers dealing with um, copay rules? Um, those are both uh, interesting questions. And I, I guess I'd frame the answer By, by doing a little tutorial first on how physician compensation is, is calculated. And it's calculated on three dimensions. Uh, one is time. So someone mentioned 10 minute versus half hour. So time. The second one is complexity. If in that 10 minutes I do something that requires 15 years of training and I can convince payers that that's true, then I may be able to bill more for it. And the third is practice expense. Um, now, most of us would say that for any telehealth interaction, that time and complexity um, are the same. Meaning, if I only spend 10 minutes, that's probably a level one follow-up, and that's, that is what it is. Um, if, if it's not a comp, maybe it's a when two seconds. Uh, how are your blood pressures? They're fine. Let's see them. Great. Okay, keep on the same medicine. That's probably that visit and that's what I would bill in the office and that's what I should bill over video. In other words, it shouldn't change. The half hour is a longer visit, probably more complex and probably worth more. So it isn't so much to me the video versus in person, it's, it's the, those two things, complexity and time. We will, we are, I should say, we are doing some work to examine what the practice expense will be, in fact, I have a meeting on it later this afternoon, when we scale telehealth in this new environment. And it's complicated. And when I was showing the slide of the uh, new brick and mortar in Mass General, I tried to allude to that. It's really complicated because of the economics of how hospitals work, because of the, uh, if you think about it, I, I'm, let's pretend I'm in an office, not, not even a hospital. I'm a, I'm a do dermatologist in the community. I'm gonna have a full-time assistant, full-time nurse probably, maybe a nurse practitioner. Those people are employees, they expect to be paid. So if I go off on Tuesday afternoon and just do telehealth, I still have to pay them. So they're still part of my overhead. Um, so we just don't know if practice expense is gonna be less or more of the same, we're, we're figuring that out. So I know very long-winded answer, but it's an important uh, question. So I thought it was worth the time. Oh, absolutely, in fact, there was another question related to medical offices long-term, if we saw any um, reduction in their footprint, but I think you answered that, uh, that well. There's, there's a lot well, you know, there. just quickly on that, um, one of my favorite stories to tell is, is when the automatic teller came in, and of course, tellers were all afraid of their jobs. Now, I, probably people know this, but we employ more tellers now than we did then because the, the footprint of the branch has changed. 
and there's a branch on every corner now. So these technologies can have uh, uh, different consequences than we originally envisioned. Actually, there's a follow-up, Joe. Um, I think uh, if you could spend some more time talking about copays and how those are affected by tele. Oh, right. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't address that. So the answer is it's local by local. I'm doing some um, some canvassing now of Massachusetts payers, and and uh, I get um, and I don't I don't mean this to be disrespectful to them, but I get no clear answers from them on anything. They're like, well, we'll have to see, and you know, it depends on the person's plan, and so. Copays is a mess. I would say the one thing though that does come up and, I, and I, it's worth, worth uh, mentioning is Medicare and the term copay. Uh, I think most of you know Medicare does not have a copay. It has a coinsurance and that's an important difference. Meaning Medicare, it pays 80% of your bill. You, got, you either pay 20% out of pocket or you, or you get another insurer. And um, that's all. So it, 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 Medicare again, doesn't have any copays. It does have the requirement for, for another plan or, or uh, co-insurance. Thank you. A question about um, very timely is how are medical schools responding to telemedicine? Yeah, one of the other things that I do that's a lot of fun is uh, that the Association of American Medical Colleges, AAMC, uh, is creating a series of competencies. That That's where I uh, recently got more involved with Website Manor. They're creating a series of competencies around um, around um, how to get telehealth um, taught more uniformly across our medical schools and residencies. It's coming out soon, so I look forward to that because it's there's a great need there. Okay, I think we got time for um, a couple What's more. Um, there's a question back to the issue of. Um, licensing um, and uh, if, if national licensing occurs, but probably a good question just in, in general, um, will we eventually come up against a out of plan response? Uh, do you think insurers will relax this um, for coverage? For licensure? Yeah, it says if, if national licensure occurs and we see patients at a distance, will we eventually come up to this, you know, being, you know, a physician out of, out of plan? I think again, it's probably going to let you. Know. Yeah, yeah, that's a complicated answer. I mean, again, mm -hmm. I, I'm, um, I, I would, yeah, great question, and I and I don't, I mean, it's it's too convoluted for me right now to think that. Way. Right. <laughs> Good. Um, quick question on another angle of telehealth. Um, we think of telehealth as a way for individuals to get um, care. What about a way to remotely manage the health of a family member, such as an older older patient? Yeah, great question. So there, there's a whole uh, sub-industry around uh, technologies that allow caregivers to care for um, pa usually parents that are, that are uh, miles and miles away, different states or, or, or a long drive. And um, they're, they're controversial. A lot of those um, so-called elderly parents don't really want to be spied on by their, by their um, younger uh, children, adult children. So I think the industry hasn't quite figured out how to, how to thread the needle of giving the adult children all the data they want to care for their mom and dad and having mom and dad comfortable with sharing all the data. Um, Joe, I want to be respectful of your time, but before I turn it over to, to, to Bert, I want to offer my personal thanks again. It was a wonderful presentation. Great Thank having you. you. Um, one other question I think is maybe a challenge for you, but are there any other thought leaders you can recommend, especially in the tech side that you'd suggest watching? Certainly we're all gonna to continue to uh, follow Dr. Joe uh, Kavader, but uh, are there any other folks uh, you'd recommend? Um, I mean, we're, we're, so this is a blanket, but it's a, it's a fair statement. We're, we're, we are, a, you guys are a stone's throw from MIT and so much energy comes out of there. So I just set my Google News feed up to, you know, anytime M MIT and telehealth comes up and you'll get just amazing stuff. That to me, that's a better strategy than a person. Very good. I do have to sign off though. I'm sorry, I have another uh, meeting that I have to go to. So thank you guys for inviting me and, and all the wonderful questions. And I, you all have my contact information. So very happy to uh, interact with you if you wish. Thank you so much, Joe. This was just wonderful. Great to have you back.
<clears throat> Ed, great job. Thank you so much for moderating this today. Sure thing. Yeah, this was a, uh, some, a lot of good information. Uh, we did record this, and uh, we have our partnership with the Cape Cod Community Media Center. Uh, they're going to be uh, perhaps showing this on their channel. And we're going to try and have it up on our YouTube channel at some point in the hopefully near fu future for if you want to refer back to it. And so you also will be able to see uh, Dr. Kavader's slides as well. So thank you all, everybody, for coming today. Uh, very much appreciate your time. And hope to see you maybe next week at Infrastructure or our coffee Q&A on Friday. So thank you all. Enjoy your day. Thanks,